Hi, everybody. Oh, gosh, that's loud. Hi, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are in the Delivering Climate Resilience Infrastructure at a Faster Pace with Better Results panel, so I hope you are in the right place. We have a really great panel here today, really excited to talk about this. Um, pers I, so I should introduce myself. My name is Tyler. I'm the Director of Resilience at the Waterfront Alliance. This conversation, this topic comes up quite a bit in my work. Why are we not doing infrastructure faster and better, I guess? And so here is a panel to tell you why and how what we can do to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll pass it off to Carly to kick us off. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tyler. And I just want to make sure that is this, I don't think this is working yet. I just want to, no worries. And then um, just a quick note, there are a lot of folks in this room, as there have been in each one of the panels. And so uh, just a, a note about emergency exits. There is only one door um, exiting here. So just if there is an emergency, it'll be really important for us to walk kind of in a controlled fashion, not bowling over each other. And then um, the emergency exit will be down the stairs and then out and around. So I always think that's important to highlight. I'm really excited about this panel today. This is a very meaty topic. And I do also kind of want to name that there was this, there's this really healthy tension that Lorian invoked when she spoke a little bit earlier. And that's this idea that we really need to be able to make decisions at a pace that engages those that would be affected by those decisions. We need to make the right decisions, but there's also a key urgency to act. So I want to name that tension, and this panel is going to really focus on the latter half of that tension, where we talk about urgency and how we're going to move things a little bit more quickly. I just want to take a moment to see who's in the room. So how many folks in this room are in the public sector? OK, great. Um, private sector consulting? OK, what about contractors? OK, engineers? Planners, public officials, and did I miss any kind of disciplines in the room? Students? Okay. Awesome. Okay, this is great. We have a really diverse audience here. On the screen, you're going to see a survey link. I would love for you, if you could take out your phone and just bookmark that survey. Don't do it during the panel because we want you to engage in the panel. But what we're going to do with the information that you provide in this survey, and you get to decide whether you're going to be anonymous or you know, um, named in it, we're going to take all of the feedback. And this is really going to be about lessons learned and best practices in project delivery. Because why have a room full of experts and not actually leverage all of the genius that you all have? So we're asking you to fill this out, provide us the feedback. We will take and compile your feedback and report it back to you. And the Waterfront Alliance and others in this room are also engaging in a lot of advocacy and hard work on these topics. And so hopefully with that feedback, you know, that'll help um, spur us on. Also, this um, session has PDH credits associated with it. So uh, pay attention, because I think there'll be some questions at the end. Uh, so uh, I guess a little bit about me. I have the honor of being, I'm the moderator today, and I have the honor of being Arcadis's newest water management practice director. Arcadis is a global design and consulting firm. We're also the sponsor of the panel today. And it's headquartered in the Netherlands. We focus on things like mobility, places, resilience, and intelligence and technology. And um, I've been with the firm for about 15 years. Before that, I was in commercial real estate development. So I know a little bit about kind of project implementation. And water management is a diverse group of planners, scientists, modelers, engineers, funding consultants, and other specialists who really focus on planning, designing, funding, quantifying the benefits of implementing and managing climate adaptation infrastructure. So this is really exciting for me to be here today with you all. Very honored to have this panel. And um, I call them nerd superheroes, right? Because if we all do the work that we're supposed to be doing, right? Like, you know, we can ideally sit back and relax while the floodwaters come. So this panel is has a wealth of experience and insights. They've spearheaded projects that showcase best practices and lessons learned. 
in navigating the complexities of these resilient infrastructure, and they're doing it from the unique perspective of the project owner. So I'm gonna just take two minutes to frame the issue, and then we'll dive into the panel. So I, I probably don't need to say this to you all in the room, but just for its own sake, you know, future generations are gonna look back on this time as an historical crossroads. We are the generations that will determine through our actions and our inactions which communities are gonna thrive, which will merely survive, and which are gonna crumble beneath the compounding weights of aging infrastructure, social and environmental injustice, mistrust, legacy decisions, and a changing climate and risk context. It's changing right before our eyes, and we're all together in this. The timelines of these major threats are exceeding our pace to understand, agree on, and implement these projects. So over the next 45 minutes, we're gonna explore questions like, how can more transformative projects uh, happen smarter, better, faster, and dare I say, more affordably? Where might it be possible to streamline factors that delay projects, incre increase costs, and leave us with continued risk and disrupted communities? Things like procurement and third-party risks. And what tools can help us move forward with highly complex contexts and things like below-grade unknowns that no matter what we do, they're going to continue through construction? So the answers to these questions will save lives, they'll save property, they'll save livelihoods and communities. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to share with us who you are, a little bit about your background, and please you know, come right out of the gate with your perspective on this and any key takeaways you want the folks in the room to, to walk away with. Great. So I'll start with you, Alexis. All right. Um, is this on? Can you all hear me? Um, I'm Alexis Taylor. I'm Vice President of um, Climate Resilience at New York City um, Economic Development Corporation. And uh, my background is in urban planning and urban design. And I actually, right, I remember the first professional project that I worked on was um, uh, a little civic park uh, in Los Angeles. I was in my 20s. And when I saw the timeline that it was gonna take ten, three years, three years from design to complete construction, I thought that's a lot of people, <laughs> three years. Anyway, it's still the only completed project <laughs> that I've worked on. Because if you fast forward, uh, I, the last 11 years, the better part of my career, I have spent on large scale coastal resilience projects uh, on both sides of the river. Um, many of them stemming out of uh, an effort after Hurricane Sandy, uh, Superstorm Sandy, called Rebuild by Design. Um, and these projects in various iterations uh, and various stages are projects that I've uh, been working on for now, you know, the best part of my career, I'll say. Um, you're actually surrounded right now uh, by a portfolio of coastal resilience projects called the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience Portfolio. Um, and uh, one is on constru in construction right outside the window. So we have the opportunity with these projects to actually do very quick learning in the case of a project lifespan um, uh, because since Hurricane Sandy, New York City has been implementing all of these projects and compartments. I, um, the latest project that I'm working on uh, for the last year and a half is called the FIDI and Seaport Coastal Resilience Project. It's the last remaining gap in this lower Manhattan portfolio. It's, it's only about uh, 0.9 miles, but it is a very technically complicated waterfront um, for a lot of reasons. The sheer amount of infrastructure that's underground, it's bridging seven subway tunnels, um, it's also a very important project in order to complete the line of protection um, in Lower Manhattan. So when I came to uh, take on this project, um, I was asked to kind of take it from its project con early conception and really decide how it was going to be implemented. Uh, and as such, we are looking, even though we're still in the early design phases, less than 30% design, we are considering right now all of our options for alternative delivery and across the range of delivery. 
Um, and one of the way, I guess what I'll offer is one of the ways that I kind of think about this and frame out the concept is really about risk management and managing risk across all the phases of a project. And so what alternative delivery allows you to do is kind of think about that transfer of risk, but in a way, if, it, if it's a genuine opportunity, you're doing it in a way where you're apportioning it to the party that also has the most control and ability to do it, right? So um, we haven't decided on kind of one, whether we're going, you know, design build, progressive design build, um, but I really think about as, as we're going through all of the options, kind of how are we managing risk throughout the entire lifespan of the project? And with that, I will pass it off. Allison? Yeah, if I can. Alexis, You're not Dennis, there you go. Thank you, Carly. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name's Allison Landry. I oversee infrastructure for the mayor's office on the deputy mayor for operations team. And I'm also a licensed architect, so my background into this space really came kind of in a similar way, I would say, to Alexis with working on projects as an architect for public owners and trying to understand why they were so technically complicated, not on the technical side of engineering, <laughs> but on the process and procedure side. So that um, helped me wind my way into where I am now. Previously, I was at the Department of Design and Construction. I oversaw their build out of a design build pilot program. Um, and I've also worked at the Economic Development Corporation in their capital program overseeing initially um, resilience projects on the building side and then shifting more into the landscape and architecture space as well. Um, I think one thing just to offer as a, a framing moment is the way that we, you know, again, it's, it, for me it's all been about the way that we do this work, the way that we work together. It's not about just troubleshooting like one specific special project. It's the whole system that we have to deliver all of these projects and meet the demand of climate change and the sense of urgency with deferred maintenance and state of good repair and all of these complicated projects that have to be built. So getting the right people in the room is super important. That's the first step. But having the right tools as public owners to help support the interactions that are needed to ensure that we have success on our projects. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that a little bit more today. Holy smokes, my face is enormous. <laughs> How are you? Everybody else is smiling. I'm just this enormous face. All right, if anybody bumps in my mother later, you saw me with my coat on. All right, that's what you're going to tell her. Airing it out. I'm airing it out. I'm Dennis Ryan. I come with the DEP in New Jersey. Um, I'm the Director of Resilience Engineering Construction. I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank Allison for having me. I want to thank Alexis for joining us on this table. I think it's a really group bunch, a great bunch, and, uh, and working together this week has been a lot of fun. But I think, Alexis, what I heard was the building capacity part um, and uh, the building capacity that we're getting from all this money coming in that gives us this opportunity to learn faster. And, um, and we're building that capacity at the DEP to try and to, to build our projects faster by being able to train each other because we have the money and, um, and the opportunity. Um, you can see, uh, you know, I've been here forever. Um, I, I'm at the end of my career. Every five years, I change some part of me in the, in the department, came from Has Waste, and ended up in climate resilience about 12 years ago. And what an opportunity it was. And I'm so glad I, I took uh, my boss up on that opportunity. And here I am as the director of a program that's just amazing. Um, I'm in charge of uh, the dam safety program. We have 1,700 dams, 500 are high risk dams to uh, uh, high risk to public or the community. Um, I have the flood uh, engineering and coastal engineering programs, one done, you know, obviously we have a lot of beach, and then I have another unit that does flood engineering more on the interior of the state, but we're, we're seeing some overlap now um, where they're affect, you know, we're having tidal flooding and coastal flooding, and so they're starting to work together more than they ever have in decades past, which is really exciting to be part of, and I also have the uh, national flood insurance program in my unit, and um, and an operation and maintenance unit that's beginning to grow, very similar to probably Lorianne talked about it earlier uh, in New York City. Um, we're imagining lots of programming, lots of O&M. And uh, I currently have six projects under construction, totaling $1.1 billion uh, underway. That's a direct result of the, the federal investment, um, FEMA funding, HUD funding, uh, core money, NOAA, uh, the American Rescue Fund, the bill, the bill money and the DURSA money. If anybody doesn't know all those letters, they all come with t 
tons and tons of money if you applied. And, um, and I know New York State, New York City has really uh, have been actively recruiting some of those funds, and so have we. Um, I have one project that's using five of those funds simultaneously. I, I don't, um, it's gonna be pretty scary when we add up all the budgets. Um, right now we have, with the core, we're doing the Greenbrook infrastructure project, Port Monmouth and Union Beach. Those are huge infrastructure projects we're doing along our coast and inside Somerset County. But to build off Alexis's point on capacity um, and build, it, 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 to learn, we're also doing internal projects. We're doing the Hig Higby Beach, Beach, Beach Restoration in Cape May. Um, we're learning how to do uh, these types of projects so we can replicate them with our own money and our own investment when possibly in the future that the federal money isn't available. We need to learn how to do it ourselves, and we are at Higby Beach, the Rebuild by Design Hudson River Project and the Rebuild by Design Meadowlands Project are all in the construction phase right now and they're totaling $600 million in, in real uh, flood resilience capital being invested in our state. And I think uh, when completed, they're gonna transform our community. But I think I, I'm imagining how we do these projects faster, but in the end, we're gonna finish them. And uh, what I'm gonna talk to later on is really about the O&M and an improperly maintained system. When we finish all six of those, mm -hmm. if they're not maintained and or if they're improperly maintained, they're not gonna protect anyone um, or that we're gonna forget who is in charge. I still have projects that we encounter that no one knows who owns that tight gate and who owns that creek and who cleans out that ditch. And I'm sure you guys all see it, right? Your first design is we have three tight gates already. Somebody put them in the 70s. We don't even know who cleans it out. Um, so those are challenges we're having that at the end of all these projects, who pays, who's responsible, and uh, who's providing oversight for those projects when they're completed. And um, I think I'm gonna chat more, but uh, I think that's a good start, And uh, unless you think I need more. That's great, yeah, thank you so much. And that's such a wonderful point about the fact that these projects are not gonna be effective ultimately if, if, they're, maintained, if they're not maintained. And so, um, Dennis, I think we'll actually stay with you and, and um, I have questions for each of you and we'll kind of work in reverse order here. You know, you've been with the department for 36 years. You've seen a lot of projects delivered. And so how have the needs and expectations around those projects changed and what are some lessons learned that you would like to share and want to see carried forward? I have some notes here and I have them. Um, I think I think if I it's I think it, it's got to be the coordination that you're all hearing right throughout a theme. You're hearing communication with the community, taking community input, um, real community input, where we're listening, we're incorporating that input. Um, I, I had a project last year, I regret it. It was so simple. Somebody in the community and the five members of the community came forward and said, could you just turn this 90 degrees? There was no engineering reason why not to do it. And I should have done it. And, and I, I think we need to listen to the community when they talk to us because sometimes they have a point that, that an engineer should be listening for. Um, I would also, Alexis, I don't know where, where you think I could head with that. We did so much years, together. Yeah. We did so much together with the community and, yeah. and, and developing projects that, that people want. Yeah. Well, I will say, so Carly um, started off by talking about the urgency of now in the moment. I think the two areas that you can't speed up, and I've looked for efficiencies in every possible phase, but the two areas that you cannot speed up are community engagement. Yep an environmental review. Those just take as long as, and what you put into them, you will get out of them. But I think that there are areas that we are identifying that you definitely can shorten that um, lead time. And Allison in particular has been, um, she actually came from EDC where she got to test some of these um, for the first time on city projects here. Um, and so I think you had a lot to you have a lot to learn from where those areas are uh, for, that you can cut down. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think it's such a good flag to identify like if it's community engagement, if it's environmental, like what are the drivers that set your schedule? It's like you're doing your inventory at the very beginning of the project, and everyone says, "How do you just make more happen up front? How do you make more <laughs> happen up front?" Like that's not always the answer. Like yes, you have to have solid requirements defined up front, but 
the more that we can look at, oh, on this project, like, like you mentioned, at Battery Park City Authority, how they're doing their progressive design build, how they had their builder team work with the community to get feedback mm -hmm. that helped iteratively shape the design of that project. And that's something that they're able to do because they have a very specific procurement tool that's not currently available to city agencies, but cities and states across the country are really advocating to say, hey, how do we get the builder part of our design team early on so that when we're doing this first round of community engagement, it's not like, oh, we talked to this one team and then we had to go back and talk to a second team yep. and then we have to go back and talk to a third team because you're right. Not only is the community frustrated when you don't listen to them, but they're especially frustrated if you don't listen to them three different times with three different team members that are procured <laughs> three separate steps. I, yeah. I absolutely agree. And and I think, I think uh, I really, Alexis, I liked how you put pick the ones that are getting a little longer for us, right? We're always talking about how we, we're, <laughs> we're hoping we can accelerate things. And there's parts of, you know, uh, feasibility design and construction. We have clearly figured out how, how to shave time, but there's the community input is real. And if you do real investment into that, it's going to take time. And uh, I will tell you in my 36 years to the, the start of the question is what's changed. I have become a realtor. Um, I think I work for RE Max and I could be licensed to sell homes because reality is a real, uh, is, is part of the job now. As part of the schedule, once we get feasibility and you, once you've established your project, the, the, the reality acquisition is fixed and it takes years. Uh, I have Sandy lawsuits still ongoing. Uh, we've got the easements, but I'm still settling easements from then, that period in court. That's how long this takes. And, um, and, and getting the community support early, getting them to understand why we're taking some of the properties or um, voluntarily uh, giving up some of the properties makes the project go faster. Um, but, but again, I, I think, Alexis, that was your point, those fixed drivers that we, I can't control really seems to be a big problem for me. I hit, I hit it at a certain part of the design and everybody says, how come you haven't started yet? And I just don't have the rights to work on it yet. And, uh, and I'm gonna keep working on it. We're gonna see, see if we can shorten it. I, I, Alexis, I think that built off some of the fixed ones, right? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. And so for the audience, I think the r there's a real key takeaway there. Stephen Covey said, with people, slow is fast and <laughs> fast is slow. And so what I'm hearing from the panel is that you need to take the time on the front end doing the engagement in a quality way, in a thorough way, because ultimately that's going to speed things on the back end because you've taken that time. And um, Allison, to you, you've had incredible experience testing and experimenting and also adapting in high pressure environments like your COVID centers of excellence as well as your pilot design build program that you spearheaded. Um, are there any kind of key lessons from that experience that you would like to see carried forward or anything to share there? Absolutely. So I'll talk first about the, the COVID centers of excellence. I think this is a really interesting model for resilience projects because this is directly in response to the COVID crisis in the city of New York to say, okay, we can do things like build, uh, you know, temporary hospitals and vaccine sites and testing clinics, things like this, but to really build permanent healthcare sites, what are we able to do as a city to retrofit existing buildings? And there's a reason why the city turns to a tool like CM Build, a tool that EDC uses very often on projects. The city of New York right now for city agencies does not have the ability to use this widespread. This is typically a procurement method that we can use only in emergencies. And the way that it worked on the COVID centers of excellence is we were able to onboard our designer and our builder at the same time so they could work together to scope all three sites. These were existing buildings. One of them in Bushwick was 100 years old. So like the survey drawings that we inherited did not match where the walls were. It did not match the existing conditions. And we needed to build not just clinic space, but we put in a permanent MRI, we put in bone density. These were all spaces for post-acute COVID care. So the idea was how can we do this as a city and not have it take six or seven years? How can we build projects in six to nine months? And the success of having a construction manager on board, bringing all of the subs on, not only did it mean that we could do more engagement across the contracting community, like have really successful MWBE engagement and onboard lots of different individual companies to leverage their expertise. It also unlocked our phasing with our design team to say, hey, what decisions do you need and when? And how can we work backwards together to have the right input areas 
those things that have more um, engagement, like we're talking about community engagement. In this case, it was our the medical community, right? It was the nurses that we were working with and the doctors we were working with and their patient care standards. But to be able to calibrate that to say, you know what, we can do some of this fit out and construction, like the basic work now, even if we're not going to pick like the wall coverings or the furniture for a few months. And to adapt that same mentality to infrastructure, it's okay, well, let's get in there and figure out what's going on with our geotechnical conditions. Let's see where the utility relocations are. Let's better understand the existing fixed points that say, you know what, it really doesn't make sense for us to work around that easement. If we can't ever get it, what's the workaround? Right. Sometimes we have to make those changes and having the right team on board to help with constructability during the design process is so important. Uh, it's not always to say, oh, this is a fixed condition, 100% design, let's go bid it out, and in a few years we'll have a contractor tell us they have to redesign it all, like, and in the meantime we're still, you know, getting that easement or whatever it is. No, we've done, that, we've done that. We've retreated yeah. off a design decision because yeah. the easement was too hard to get. Yeah. And, and to get to your point, to get the project delivered earlier. Uh, that, and so the key takeaway that I, I heard there was this idea of bringing the folks that have to implement like your construction managers into the upfront design process. And maybe a follow on question for you, Allison, there is how, what questions did you ask of yourself and of the process to ensure that you had those folks identified? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the initial, and I'll, again, this is like kind of wonky, so hope no one falls asleep, I'll go quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, design build. The city was able to get design build enabling authority and we started using it on a really specific cohort of projects including the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. We're not there yet. We're still preparing for environmental review. That's another panel for a different day. Um, <laughs> but we then were able to expand it to use on other project types. And one of the things that we learned at the Department of Design and Construction is that this tool was very well suited to new buildings because designers and builders on teams going through procurement could understand what your um, requirements were up front. They understood the programming and preliminary design and they could help give feedback on that as part of a procurement. Whereas a tool like say CM Build, that's something that we could use in a renovation project. Or a tool like Progressive Design Build is something that would be really successful for resilience infrastructure or some of our more complex um, horizontal projects. So really mm -hmm. looking, I think one of the lessons learned, Carly, is that it's not just one tool. And as Dennis mentioned, like even people that have been doing this for their entire career, there's not any one specific tool. It's getting the right tools for the different project characteristics. And then it's also everything else. Like we're working across the city agencies right now on capital process reform, even things like getting our invoices turned around more quickly so that contractors can be a little bit sharper with their pencils when they're putting in bids to the city. That's things that save us money, that allows us to do things directly, like build more rain gardens because we don't have to add as much contingency to everything. So it's both like these big moves, pursuing legislative changes to allow us to have more tools, but it's also looking at our process season figuring out where can we find some efficiencies and save time so using tools like design build but then also constantly reevaluating your processes to make sure that they're that's a, that's great and so Alexis you know you you were involved in the rebuild by design and some really incredible infrastructure over there and then you've also been leading research into ways that we can improve project delivery through your financial district project. Mm -hmm. And um, can you share with us any outcomes from that research or also your lessons learned that would be particularly promising? Yeah. So um, one of the reasons that we started to seriously investigate uh, alternative delivery for FIDI Seaport was actually there was there was an incentive in, involved, which is um, Lorian referred to the the um, Army Corps of Engineers Hacks project, huge project on both sides of the river. Um, the Army Corps is piloting um, a, an alternative delivery program. Uh, out of their headquarters, which allows for more local control and local delivery of what our Army Corps authorized projects. If you can show, demonstrate, that you can deliver it on a shorter time frame than the Army Corps can. Um, now I thought, that's not hard. <laughs> I can do something <laughs> quicker than the Army Corps can. Um, <laughs> but the <laughs> The, the real trick here is that um, uh, you, you actually, you, you need to use alternative delivery 
And one of the reasons that it takes the Army Corps so long is because of their procurement and the number of packages that they kind of chop a project up into. And so for each of those packages, right, and, and you've seen this happen with like vertical stacks where someone else is doing the plumbing and someone else is doing the whatever, and the, it leads to such huge um, inefficiencies. And so um, uh, not yet being part of this alternative delivery pilot program, we started to really position FIDI Seaport in a way that we could seriously take on design build or progressive design build with lessons learned. Of course, I see Gwen here in, uh, from the Battery Park City Authority um, in order to demonstrate that, that by transferring the risk really to the local entity, and in this case, the city, that we actually could better manage that risk. Um, and we ended up doing an uh, actual, uh, like a workshop with all the Army Corps folks. And I remember one of the first things that they said to me is, how risk averse are you? And I thought, <laughs> oh me, I'm not risk averse. This is great. And they're like, no, the city. How risk averse <laughs> yeah. is the city? And I thought, well, that's a different different question. <laughs> Alexis, for the record, though, I, th I think I'm going to save more time because I'm going to steal your notes on how you did it. Um, it's written because the Corps is going to learn with you how to do that and um, it's going to be one of the first ones in the country that would pull this off mm -hmm. and I am going to steal your notes because um, it's it, right it's a journey they're All learning they're learning they're learning with us on, on that idea and I'm excited for you can I just build on that though actually I think that's something that's so important about this conversation is that as owners, we're all sharing notes because it's important to say, hey, we learned this, this was a problem, this contract term is a problem, it doesn't make it commercial, we're not able to get good pricing or people are having a hard time understanding our requirements, how do we recalibrate? I think that that's something we can also do to accelerate our projects is ensure that across the industry partners that we're getting to work on our projects, like this is who we rely on, this community that builds our projects for us, whether it's the contractors and the workforce themselves or all the members of the team soup to nuts that are part of that coalition. And the more that we can do to make our procurements predictable so it's not like every single time there's a new procurement, you're downloading a brand new contract and like figuring out what's different about it. But the more that we as public owners can say, hey, this is a way that we've modeled this that's been successful. Let's try and standardize that across the region and make sure that people are sharing information. It also just makes it faster on the industry side for your teams to put, you know, to be responsive. This is an important area, I think, for discussion and exploration because innovations in procurement, they're not sacrificing any of the time that you need for engagement or on the environmental and historic preservation. And so I think we have time for two quick questions for the panel before we move to the audience and your questions. Um, so kind of building on what you were just talking about, what are some wild ideas that you would like to see further explored or that we would invest more research and development in. That's for anybody on the panel. So I'm, I'm gonna build off something that Allison said and that um, uh, Dennis actually let me pilot a little bit in New Jersey, which is uh, <laughs> all conflicts of interest aside, I think we need the consultants, the contractors in the room as we are developing these tools. Uh, and at, at, at one point, Dennis did allow me to move forward with a project where I brought everyone in and kind of a, you know, and, and now it would be a, you know, an RFEI or whatever, um, but actually help us shape from the very, very early phases what the project scope should be. Um, in a way that we had kind of the engineers and, and designers and contractors in the room. Now, it was very difficult to get around conflict of interest law. <laughs> but I think that comes from another time when there was a lot more corruption. And now, like how we're working collaboratively, and it's something Allison said, we need industry there with us working on the contracts, telling us what language totally does not make sense. And, and, and again, it's about you know apportioning risk in contracts in a way that, that people are really comfortable with the risk that they're taking on as part of the project, but also that they have the mechanism to address it, control it, change it. Um, and so I think we need uh, government and industry kind of together in the room figuring out what, what these best tools and mechanisms are for design build moving forward. 
Yeah, so maybe someone in the room can kind of be thinking about how mm -hmm. to make that happen, whether it's a hypothetical workshop, you know, tabletop exercise or what have you. Um, and also, you know, what do, does anybody else want to respond to that yeah. wild idea? Okay. I, I wasn't that wild. I sure will. <laughs> um, as part of the Mayor's Capital Process Reform Task Force, we've actually brought together a coalition of industry groups and builders and MWBEs and all of the architect, engineer, construction membership organizations that are essential to this effort to help give feedback to government of what should we be changing about our process, right? We've done some of these are the internal reforms that I mentioned, but others are legislation. So my wild idea, <laughs> the little note that I put below my pillow every night <laughs> right now until June 7th, which is the end of session <laughs> in Albany, <laughs> is to get a bill passed. I <laughs> would love. This is your call to action. I this would love. Yes. <laughs> for support from everyone in this room and everyone in your friends and family adjacent areas to help us get alternative delivery passed for the city of New York. I think this is really just one of the game changer tools that if we can call on legislator, we've done a lot of educating over the past three years. We've been in Albany more times than I want to admit. Uh, and I think we're ready to get it done. But we need to get this bill passed uh, this year in session. So we're working right now to get our introductions and committee agendas before the end of session and support to see that happen so that we can then really use this momentum of recent success with lessons learned on initial design build and working with our other uh, public owners in the region that are also piloting on design build and progressive design build that we can use this momentum and get it done. Awesome. And you actually asked my second answer my answered my second question, which was going to be, what do you all need from this group in order to help make these <laughs> ideas happen? And, and you rolled right with it, so that's great. That's um, and um, is there any question I didn't ask that you wished I would have asked before we move to the group? All right. Well, and we'll have time for closing as well. So, does anybody in the audience have questions for our panel? Hi, this is for Alexis. We've kind of worked a little bit on the HATS program also, and one thing we found was when the Army Corps, I'm, I'm from Long Island City and we have a park, yeah. and part of what they, what Army Corps in the initial plan was putting a flood wall right through our salt marshes. Mm -hmm. And when we questioned them on it, they said, well, no one's ever been there, but they needed to get something done quickly to get federal funding. But um, anyway, what you're doing with them, could you just expand a little bit more on the project? Is, is the city taking it over and getting their own contractors, or how would that work? Yeah, so um, to, to be figured out, it, it's nothing official. I think it just has to do with um, we're exploring ways. Now that New York City has developed this clear competency in being able to deliver coastal resilience projects, as evidenced in Eastside Coastal Resilience and every other project that's under construction. And I think that, um, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and Lorian, who we heard here at lunch, is really learn, is leading this work. But we are looking at options that we can have more local control um, and city control over the delivery of these projects. Now, what that looks like, as with most things in the core, it hasn't been done before. <laughs> and so there's not a clear roadmap. Um, uh, they are slowly working through federal legislation to make it more possible. Um, but uh, like many things, it's like we need to be figuring it out at the same time as we're waiting on the legislation. Um, because once it is passed, and I'm sure this will be passed on June 7th, um, <laughs> your legislation, not the Army Corps, they take longer. <laughs> uh, you wanna make sure that you have the core capacities yeah. and the resources. And so really, even since like Allison's been at EDC, we've been developing that core capacity to do this alternative delivery, expanding our expertise, because we wanna make sure that we're able to do those projects as soon as they're legally available. Does everybody in the room know what alternative project delivery is? Does anybody want? A, a quick five second. <laughs> Does somebody on the panel want to yeah. kind of take I that? Do, yeah. I can do a quick five second. So um, typically the way that the city has to deliver work is we hire a designer, that's one procurement, and then we do design 100% and then we hire a contractor. Sometimes we have to hire multiple contractors, it depends. But it's always a sequential process with a gap in the middle between when design is complete and when the contractor's on board. And that's because of laws. 
that are put in place to ostensibly protect the taxpayer and the fisc, but times have changed. <laughs> I think we've demonstrated through really smart and savvy public owners that have different procurement rules that are able to use tools like CM Build. We've seen this work successfully. We've seen tools like Design Build, which means you're hiring a designer and a builder together as one procurement. Um, work for other public entities like the state DOT uses it, but city DOT can't, as an example. So these are examples of tools that other public owners have and have used in other jurisdictions, but right now in the city of New York we don't have. And when we say alternative delivery, we typically mean design build, progressive design build, and, and CM build. So just different ways of onboarding, a, a, like essentially it's bringing a builder on as part of the team. The specific contract structure, if it's one contract or two contracts is different, but you're hiring them during design. And what sort of circumstances would you say alternative project delivery are most appropriate? So, I mean, I, I'm sure we've all had different experiences with different tools on different but projects. But I, I personally have not done one, but I've done a lot of research into yeah. this um, because every time I got close enough, again, it comes down to capacity. If I haven't done it, you know, I have to start at a pilot level, and, and, yeah. and we all have to take baby steps. But our New Jersey D, uh, D, DOT does have the right to do it and does execute yeah. it well. Um, it can save, save time. Um, at times it is a risk transfer device. Um, you are you are bringing in the contractor in and you're gonna give up a little control in, in the communication across the engineer, the designer, and the community. So it's gotta be really clear, and I know New York's gonna yeah. do that, is to make really clear whose roles and responsibilities are as the contractor comes into the group. But I believe in my heart the contractor coming in earlier will, will alleviate some of the design problems we get where we go out to bid and the contractor says that's not gonna work. Um, because it's occurring during the design. And um, and I look forward to your adventure and uh, so we can learn from it and each uh, build off mm -hmm. uh, those steps. Yeah, I mean, I heard um, super interesting talking about constructability, right, in the design phase and how to make sure that you're building that in early on so you don't get into those problems down the road. I know we're talking about project delivery, but Dennis brought up the really critical issue of maintenance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I come out of the parks world, you know, sometimes the maintenance folks are like, why weren't we involved in the design phase so that we could give input so that the maintenance of this project could be simplified. Um, so just curious if you're seeing that as a rising concern or if that's anything you're, you're currently trying to integrate into the early stages of a project. Can I pick one? I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, what we find is, why did you pick that pump? You know what I mean? I got six pumps. They were like, we never would have bought that brand if you would have brought us in earlier. That takes two people to lift or two people to, uh, to move. We're, we're imagining that. I'm building um, one, two, three, four pump stations in the next four years. We need to make sure that we're buying equipment that's easy to service because we're going to own it. We're going to have to operate it. And uh, Eric Doyle, my assistant director, is here. He's got you know two systems in Port Monmouth and, and, and Union Beach that are going in, and um, and we're going to have five pump stations in 2027. I've got to be able to manage them effectively and cost effectively, and be able to keep them running and make sure that they're ready for the next storm. Because a system that's not ready for the next storm is dangerous, and it's dangerous to the community. So we're real excited about planning for 2026, 27 as these systems come online. We have five big projects going, six big projects going. These systems are coming online, and I have to be prepared to O&M them. And I want to know who's running it, who's responsible, and who's doing third-party oversight so it's ready for the next storm. Um, I think Lori Ann, if you talk to her, she believes in it too. I, I've had chat after chat with her. We're excited about planning when these projects are done, uh, being ready to operate them. I'm going to just build on that really quickly with on design build, something that we've seen because you mentioned parks. 
um, on some of our new buildings that we're doing for the Parks Department with Design Build, one of the benefits of that contract type is we have to define the requirements up front. And so we've done this really robust stakeholder engagement, both on the community side with community visioning, but also with all of the different stakeholders within parks. And that includes, of course, their facilities team to make sure we can't bring this up at 100% design when you're reviewing our bid documents like we normally do nine months after design's done. We're going to do it now up front and really get your feedback to integrate that into the contract. And we've been able to turn that into design guidelines for our rec centers because we're doing multiple through design build. So just an example to say, if as we're rethinking our procurement tools, we're also rethinking some of the sequences for decision making to make sure that all of the right stakeholders are involved early on in the process. And I think we have time for one to two more questions, depending. Hi, thank you. <coughs> My name is Frank Ferrance. I'm from Roosevelt Island, and we have our own project that we're thinking about getting started with a berm on the north end of the island. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, procurement innovations. I know that sounds wonky, but that's actually of strong interest to me, and I've participated. So I'm a former defense contractor, and I've had to actually learn like a lot about that. So here, here, if I could pass on a couple of tips. So in hearing from the panel discussion here, I would say that one of the things that you seem to care a lot about, which of course, is system integration risk. And that's overall, and, and the, the problem where you lack the innovation is where before you had to do what I would call as a systems engineer, I'd call the waterfall method of just you have a stage, you have a stage, and you have a stage. There have been lots of innovations, certainly in other engineering disciplines, on that that you could take advantage of. I know you've heard of agile stuff. That's not what you want. But there are things that move you better and get the job done at higher quality and such. And one last thing is that because there were so many failures in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, they figured out a new method, method for addressing that. It's called capability maturity model. And those kinds of things approach to contractors and organizations, that's yourselves, okay, government entities, would then allow you a, a, a methodology to go from level one to level two to level three, where now everything you do, do stuff like clockwork and get it in time you know, sooner. But those capability maturity models also apply in this industry too. And uh, I love procurement inf uh, innovation. Hey, good luck. <laughs> yes, thank you for the comment. And we have one time for one more question, and then we'll do our little closing. Well, a question and maybe also an observation uh, for Mr. Reinknecht, uh, making uh, notes, I see. So you've been navigating rules for... very good, by the way. You're my first grade teacher. Did that very well. Very good. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Um, so we've been navigating rules for, I think, 36 years. Uh, we also know that the rules change, you know, if something bad happens and you're responsible for 500 uh, high-risk dams. So say if something bad were to happen with one of these dams and there will be casualties and it's quite ugly. So how would that inspire your day-to-day -day work? How can it advance and, you know, uh, make your processes go faster? I have an amazing team of uh, dam safety inspectors uh, working for me. Um, Clint Oman is probably one of the most uh, amazing, conscientious individuals I've ever seen. Um, I, do you remember the earthquake uh, that was east of Manhattan or west of Manhattan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we had a couple of earthquakes, and my team was on the ground within eight minutes um, uh, going to Round Valley and going to some of those dams, starting to walk. Um, I got a phone call with after they were started already. I, you know, I figured, you know, somebody was going to call me, but they were already starting to work. Um, that doesn't guarantee anything, but good inspection is always important. Um, each of the owners are responsible and have their own emergency management plans and inspection plans, and we have uh, national inspection standards that we follow. And if you want more detail, I'm going to play outside of my lane, and I'm going to suggest I give you a card, and we can follow up with some of the more inner details of how we keep our uh, dam safe for our community. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks to this panel. Um, I had some major key takeaways that were even surprises for me, you know, in preparing for this. One of them was our engagement conversation that when – with people, slow is fast, fast is slow, so make sure you have the right folks engaged early on and throughout the project, and that includes folks like your construction manager 
when you're dealing with complex urban infrastructure that where you might get surprises through the construction phase. Also innovate in the areas that we could possibly move faster. It's identifying the where the places that we want to go slow, like engagement and environmental permitting, but we want to move procurement more quickly. And we also want those folks in the room to help us shape those project scopes. Um, there's PDH knowledge checks for our folks up there, for those that need those. And I do want to kind of bring us back to this call to action for folks to, Allison Landry's point about helping ensure these bills get passed, and then we will, you know, this um, panel was really coming from the perspective of the agencies that have oversight over project delivery, and there's a lot of folks in this room that are on the project delivery side, and so we'd love to hear your insights. So if you could please, you know, participate in that survey, and we will compile the findings and share them back out. And I just want to thank you all so much for your time, your expertise, the dedication and commitment that you have to improving our communities. This is hard work, and it takes a long time, no matter how you slice it, and we are grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you.